to all right awesome so let me go ahead and get a thumbs up if you can see the slides can i get a thumbs up Oh, is that a no or a thumbs down if you can't? Okay, there we go on a thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, Ebony, iPhone. Awesome. I see you guys. Okay, so we're going to jump right into our market update today, my friends. Um, we have a lot to cover in a short amount of time, and I am going to spend a little bit of extra time today uh, talking about a topic that I think is really important. So we'll spend some time on that, just coming back out of the tail end of coming from market leadership. So of course, before we get started, I'm always going to start off with our mandatory, right? Mandatory at TCPA disclosure. Please, please, please. You know, I always go through a couple of scripts, a couple of things that you can use in your calls. Please make sure that you have scrubbed your list, my friends, um, as well. All right, jumping right in uh, on our mission moment. I actually wanted to share uh, a great slide that KW has been sharing lately, which is the one team, one mission uh, slide that has been really big on how we align KWX, all of our auxiliary services, Keller Williams worldwide, um, into how we operate as one team um, throughout you know, our, our company, throughout KWX uh, with Keller Williams Realty, Keller Mortgage, Keller Offers. Keller Financial Services, all of these different things that are under the umbrella. Uh, so I wanted to share this with you guys because I think it's really powerful. Uh, and I love that, you know, on the leadership calls, we've been getting started with this. We will probably go over this at our next team meeting so we can go a little bit more in depth with this. Um, but I did want to have the opportunity to share it with you. Uh, one of the things that was really cool about being at Mega Leadership this past week um, where we got to go with some of the leaders in the company to a resort called the Kalahari in Texas, in Round Rock, Texas. One of the things that was really amazing to see um, while we were there, the hotel staff that was working there, they were so moved by the culture of Keller Williams and some of the, the things that we had available just by watching as a, as a staff that was servicing this major event. They actually went, and I've been sharing the home shirt for the past couple of weeks, um, that has a, a portion of or the proceeds 100% going to help efforts in the Ukraine. Um, their entire staff went and bought those shirts and wore them throughout the event. And I thought it was an amazing example of our culture um, and not just our culture, but the way that our culture can actually impact others when we lead with those values, when we lead with our purpose. And so I wanted to share that with you guys. It was really moving um, for us uh, while we were out there. Uh, and I thought it was a nice kind of thing to share as part of our mission moment today. With that, we are going to jump right into some deep topics. So I'm going to start with this quote because there was a segment of Gary Keller's market update where he updated on what he went over in February at Family Reunion. In, in February, he went over his market update as a whole. Um, now, there's a lot that's happened since then. Uh, everything going on in the Ukraine being a big part of that. We're seeing the increase uh, in the impact in our energy markets. We're seeing unemployment be very low. We're going to go over that in depth today and at our next team meeting because he made a statement which said inflation may be the single biggest threat to democracy. Um, it was a very big statement. And as we go through some of the numbers at, towards the end, when we go through industry updates, so this is, I'm kind of introducing it. We're going to go over this in depth today. Uh, I, I want you to think about that, right? Is I really, when we look at real estate and we look at the market, uh, part of the reason that we do this call is to give you the tools to speak the language of real estate, right? When it comes to this business uh, and, and as this business and as this industry continues to grow, continues to evolve, continues to change, the one thing that sets you apart from everybody else is being the local economist, the local expert of a choice. It's how you create credibility. It's how your position is the expert. We go over this information every single week to equip you with the tools to speak the language of real estate because we know there is only one secret in this business. And that is whatever your goals are financially is directly related to the number of people that when they think of real estate, they not only think of you first and not only find you easy to reach, but they find you the most credible. And the only way that they will find you the most credible is if you have the information 
that is really going to impact um, the decisions that they make on either purchasing one of the biggest assets of their life or potentially selling one of the biggest assets of their life. And so when we think about why we talk about things like inflation, why we talk about the consumer price index, why we talk about some of these things is because the goal is to really give you the tools to think about this in a bigger way and position yourself as that expert. And so I wanted to lead with this quote, we're gonna go through our four counties and then we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about some of the impact, um, some of why we're experiencing such high inflation right now. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of that impact that happens with inflation onto the real estate market. We're also gonna talk about some of the opportunity that exists when we look through, when we look at real estate through the lens of an economist, right? Um, so I, I'm starting with this as a teaser for you, my friends, but this is going to be where we spend a good amount of time uh, today. With that being said, let's jump right into Los Angeles County. So we know we're looking at month over month, March to February, um, where we are month to date. We're experiencing an increase in the number of properties that are sitting for sale from last month. Now, we always wanna take this with a grain of salt. We're always inspecting what we expect. So we're looking at month to date here and then where we are this month compared to this month last year. With that being said, number of properties for sale in Los Angeles County, month to date from last month up 7%. We look at the same time a year ago down 22.1%. We look at the number of properties sold, right? So. We're experiencing a little bit of that dip in number of properties sold of 16.2% month over month. We look at this same number from a year ago, down 25.2%. I want to put this in perspective for you guys. When we look at this same time a year ago, I am going to note, we have experienced massive decreases in the amount of available inventory over the course of the last two years, right? So the number of properties that are available for sale, if there's not enough inventory, that goes down. The number of properties sold, if there is not enough inventory for there for it to sustain the number of potential sales, that goes down. So when we're looking year over year, there's an impact there. Here's the other piece though. Why are we looking at the number of properties sold going down month, uh, month to date and the number of properties available for sale experiencing an increase? I don't know if any of you have paid attention to what is happening with the interest rates right now. But this is where we start to see and why I wanted to introduce this concept of inflation right at the beginning is because inflation absolutely has an impact on our market because inflation impacts the interest rates, right? The interest rates is the federal government's response to inflation. And that then impacts the, the trends that we're going to start seeing month over month and that we've already started to see month over month in our real estate market. So I again, we want to inspect what we're in we want to inspect what we are expecting with the market um, and what some of that impact uh, has. So this is a, a great way to look at that. We look at the number of new listings, right? So so let's look at this when we went from March to February, we saw an increase in the number of new listings of 12.7%. number of properties pended was up 22.9%. Obviously, a decrease from this same time a year ago because we've seen those inventory trends. With that being said, when we look at the month of April from the 1st through the 17th compared to March 1st through the 17th, we're experiencing a dip in the number of new listings of 26.7% in Los Angeles County, a dip in the number of properties pendant of 15.4%, a dip from last year that is to be expected again because of some of the inventory issues. And we're going to talk about how building. Um, is uh, the, the underbuilding that has occurred is also impacting some of these numbers here. We look at our pricing trends from March to February. We saw a dip in our average active price, but we always want to look at our sold price, an increase of 14.6%. So let's look at this. Where are we? Month to date. An average active price decline of 5.1%. Now we look at our average sold price from a year ago. This is still higher than average, right? This is much higher than what we tend to experience with normal appreciation, still up 12.3%. I'm talking to somebody in Los Angeles County right now. Part of the conversation, um, and, and I will give you this, right? 
family holidays. We go home for family holidays. We just experienced a couple holidays over this weekend. We go home for family holidays and inevitably, inevitably, the question or the conversation, if you work in real estate, my guarantee is that at some point that conversation gears towards real estate. I'm going to know yesterday I got three leads for three different real estate conversations in the span of two hours, right? Because our family invited some friends of the family, right? And because all of a sudden there's a question about, well, where are the rates at? What's going on with the market? What's going on with X? What's going on with this? Is now a good time to invest? Is now this? Those conversations happen. We have to be able to answer them in the best way possible. One of the conversations I had yesterday was about a cash out refi. One to invest in additional property. One was a new grad that is potentially uh, interested in, in buying a home, right? Now we need to be able to speak to those conversations. Um, this is important. We look at this average sold price over the course of the last year, and we look at this average active price experiencing a decline. This is an opportunity for us to create urgency utilizing the numbers. So do you know that the average sold price in your area has gone up by over 12% from this same time a year ago? Just out of curiosity, do you know the value of your home? Would you like to? If you've thought about selling, now might be the time to take advantage because we are starting to see a drop in the average active price of homes on the market, which means your competition is lowering their price might not now be a good time to take advantage of the equity that you've gained over the course of the next year, right? So how we use this, these numbers in conversation when we know what is happening in the market right here. All right, absorption rate, absorption rate. We are seeing an increase in the amount of available inventory. And um, when we see sales slow down, even though we don't have as much inventory coming on the market right now, we're still seeing a little bit of, a, of an increase here up to 1.2% given. That's not too different from what we saw in February. This is any major fluctuation here. Uh, and then days on market and sold versus original list. We're still experiencing a decline in days on market. So average active price has gone down, but the sold versus an original list price has gone up, right? So where properties are selling is still above that original list price. We're still seeing that number uh, stay high here. All right, moving on over to Orange County. You guys know I'm moving quickly today because I really, like I said, I want to spend a good amount of time um, really giving you uh, some time to wrap your head around this idea of inflation uh, and how that impacts the market. With that being said, all right, so our number of properties for sale in Orange County since last month, we've seen a big increase in the number of properties for sale. We saw an increase from February to March, we're seeing this increase at least one to date in April as well. But the number of properties sold, we're actually experiencing a decline thus far of 8.4%. From February to March, we look at the number of properties sold, we saw a big increase, right? This is not, if we see a decline at the end of the month, this is a, a change from what is to be expected from normal seasonality at this point of the year, where we tend to actually see an increase happening in the second quarter um, throughout, right? So, so I want now. This is going to stay a little high. We'll we'll see what this looks like um, when we end the month. We look at the same time a year ago. We're experiencing a decline in both properties for sale and number of properties sold in Orange County. Looking at our inventory trends. So while we ended the month February to March with an increase in the number of new listings and an increase in the number of properties pending. We are experiencing a little bit of a decline where we are right now in the month of April. Number of new listings down 31% month to date. Number of properties pended down 18.8% month to date. We look at the same information from a year ago. Number of new listings, right? Of course, we're anticipating that this goes down. We experienced a, we're just having major inventory issues again, right? This all comes into play after coming out of the pandemic. And pricing trends. Again, we're seeing this average active price experiencing a decline. This decline so far, thus far, month to date, is a decline of 6.4%. The other number we want to pay attention to with our pricing trends is this average sold price. Do you know that the average sold price in your area has gone up by 16.6% from this same time a year ago? 
Just out of curiosity, do you know the value of your home? Would you like to? Would you be offended if I did a market analysis for you? Right. This is how we put this into conversation. This is the number. When we look at pricing trends, if you are creating curiosity with sellers, you are creating curiosity with sellers. The most important number to look at is the average sold price year over year. So from the same time a year ago, right? That's this number right over here. Okay. Absorption rates, again, a little bit of an increase, but it's pretty similar to where we ended up the month in February. So pretty much the same as what we saw in LA. And then days on market, look at how much this is tightening up. 11 days on market is very low, right? 11 days on market is very low. That's less than two weeks, which is very interesting considering that Orange County is our highest price point county. Um, as we go through this idea of inflation, one of the things you're going to hear me talk about is uh, the this K-shaped recovery. So for the past uh, year and a half, we've been talking about this idea of a K-shaped recovery and the, the affordability gap that is being created right now because of inflation. We look at a higher price point county. Generally, when we've looked at markets in the past, in the higher price points is where we tend to see the dips happen the fastest. Because of some of the things that, that um, have happened in this particular market, because of this gap that has been created in affordability, we're not necessarily seeing this trend stay the same. What we're seeing is those that own assets that are already wealthy are experiencing a bigger increase in wealth, right? We've seen equity go up. The, the uh, value of homes go up, meaning that people have gained equity. So if they owned assets, right? Their assets go up in value, then they have more discretionary income. So this is, we look at Orange County as being a higher price point and generally in a shifted market, we see impacts in those, in those areas. That's not the case this time, right? Not, the, not in the same way. It's not the case in the same way because those that already had wealth, already owned assets, saw their assets appreciate that gain more wealth. Whereas those that don't own assets have seen the cost of living go up and yet their income has not. Right. So I want you to kind of put that lens on as we start looking at some of what's happening over here. When we see this tighten up, when we're seeing more activity happening um, in, in a higher price area. All right. Looking at Riverside County sales trends. We look at month to date. We're seeing an increase in the number of properties available for sale of 20.8 percent. Look at this small shift that happened from February to March. And now we're seeing at least month to date, a much bigger increase, a much bigger spread here. And yet the number of properties sold, which went up from February to March, this is a big jump given February is a shorter month, right? But this is still a big jump here. Um, we're seeing number of properties sold at least month to date down 20%. We look at the same time a year ago, Number of properties for sale up 21.8%. Um, this is where we were, right, in, in uh, April of last year. It's up 21.8%. Uh, and then the number of properties sold down 21.8%. So a decrease here as well. Inventory trends. We're seeing that decline. So we saw an increase last month in the number of properties pending and the number of new listings. So far months date, we see a decline of 23.5% in the number of new listings that have come on the market, a decline of 1.1 in the number of properties that are pending. We look at the same time a year ago, a decline in the number of new listings that are available, 21.4%, and then the number of properties pending actually up 6.4%. Look at our pricing trends. Average active price, not as significant a decline here. We're moving into a lower price plate, not as significant a decline, and yet still a decline in this average active price. But look at this average sold price. This is an extremely high number, 27.5% from where we were a year ago in that average sold price. Um, Riverside County, we dip into a lower price point county. 
And yet we're seeing this average sold price kind of stay up extremely, extremely significantly at 27.5%. If I'm talking to people in Riverside County, this is definitely a number that I'm talking about. Uh, what's really interesting as we start going out into the further counties as well is going to be some of the impact that we see um, and some of how this plays in with commercial real estate, right? The, the reason that I say that is this, we've seen a lot of industrial, right? A lot of industrial warehouses, um, more processing move out into those areas, right? Out into um, the further counties where they're close to some of the airports out there. It was really interesting. We had a conversation with CoStar, uh, which is one of the commercial, kind of like the commercial MLS, uh, but they collect a lot of data. They do a lot of research. And so they've seen a shift out into those areas. Now, what happens when business increases in a particular area, new jobs are created in a particular area, does that not also impact housing in a particular area? So when we see new businesses, new jobs, new things come to town, that then impacts the real estate at residentially in the market as well. So I, I want you to think of how all these things kind of work in common. I see a question in the, many people priced out of LA to go to San Bernardino Riverside County. Yes, we've seen that as well, right? A lot of that where people want more homes, more space. And so they're moving out into these further counties. You're creating a, a higher amount of demand in lower price points, right? Uh, so there's a lot of factors that kind of come into play um, here, but this is a significant, significant um, increase. When we're looking at 14% and you're jumping to 27.5, this is a very big uh, jump here. All right, our absorption rate, Again, we're at about a month of inventory. This fluctuates quite a bit, but this has not moved us into any significant new market here. And then days on market and sold versus original list. Again, a decline in days on market. And then the sold versus original list price here is actually down significantly. If you have buyers right now in Riverside County, if you have sellers in Riverside County, what this is telling me is appraisal challenges from 102% of list to 94% of list. What this is telling me is appraisal challenges, right? I would be very careful with your appraisals in this particular area. I would do your due diligence on your comparables in this area. I would make sure that you're sharing your comparables that match your purchase price with the appraiser because we know that a bad appraisal can affect on both the buy side and the sell side. Right. I also, if I'm representing on either side of the transaction here, this is a conversation I want to have with the clients to set the expectation that we might run into some appraisal challenges. Why? When a seller all of a sudden gets an offer over ask, right? An offer over ask. And let's say that they had their mindset on, oh, I'm going to get 500K. And all of a sudden they have an offer at 560. They get very excited about this extra $60,000 that they weren't expecting. If you're not having that conversation up front with them, it becomes very difficult when all of a sudden they get appraised at 520 and in their mind, they just lost 40 grand, right? And that is a harder conversation to have than to say, hey, we have these offers that are above ask and we may run into some appraisal challenges. And so we may or may not be able to achieve that value. I want to put that in your mind now so that now all of a sudden when it appraises at 520 and you're negotiating that, they still feel a gain of 20,000 instead of a loss of 40, right? It's how we set the expectation. It's how we have that conversation with them in advance, right? With our clients um, so that it makes negotiation easier, but also so they don't get emotionally attached to a number that is not set in stone yet. Um, but here I would anticipate some appraisal challenges in Riverside County. All right, moving on over to San Bernardino County. And then we're gonna, we're gonna dig a little deeper. Uh, number of properties for sale month over month. So from March to April, we're seeing an increase in 19.2%, an increase from last year of 33%. Number of properties sold, we're seeing a decline month this month since last month of 19.2%, a decline from last year of 17.3%. We look at our inventory trends. So we saw an increase from February to March. Thus far, month to date, a decrease of 23.7%. Number of properties pendant decline of 16.5%. And then, of course, we're experiencing those declines from last year, which is to be expected. 
uh, and pricing trends. So San Bernardino, lowest price point county, only county of the three where we're seeing an average active price increase of 3.5% here. So only county of the four so far that we're seeing uh, this, this increase. And then this average sold price, not as significant as Riverside County at 18.7%, um, but still pretty significant here. Um, you know, it's the other one was 29. That is a very, or 27. That is a very high number. 18 is still very, very, very high. Um, but this is a little bit more mid blink compared to what we're seeing in LA Orange and then comparing it to Riverside. Our absorption rates, again, an increase here, nothing that's going to move us out into any um, different sort of market, but still an increase that we'll kind of continue to watch here. And then last but not least, our days on market, a decline from 24 days to 18 days, and then no change in our sold versus original list price. However, we see the average active price go up. So take that with a grain of salt here on this pricing. Okay. We're going to dig into industry updates. The first two slides, we're going to go over some of the industry updates that I've gone over in the past. So I am not going to spend too much time on these, but I do want to have the slides available for you. A couple of things that have happened recently and a couple of bills that are currently on, um, should be on your radar. There are additional bills that have been submitted as it relates to housing. I am giving you those that are top of mind right now because of the immediate impact. Uh, that you should be paying attention to, some of which AB 2179 was already written into law at the end of March or already written in. Um, this was to extend the eviction protections through June 30th, 2022. So we know the tenant protection has a two-phase plan um, that you can look up, but AB 2179 created additional plan for anybody who applied for assistance from the state or local rental assistance programs by end of day, March 31st, 2022, they are now shielded from eviction. Uh, and this goes through June 30th of 2022. So I just want to add that because as we look at the tenant protections, this is now an additional part of tenant protections um, that was signed into law at the end of, at the end of last month. Um, two of the bill, three, um, well, two bills, assembly bills and one constitutional amendment that should be on your radar. One, the California Housing Speculation Act, AB 1771. The California Association of Realtors is strongly opposed to this assembly bill. Essentially, it would impose a 25% tax, right, on investors' net capital gains. So short-term investments, flip properties, somebody that sells within three years of purchasing the property would experience a tax. Now, here's the thing. I don't know about you, but I have had clients that have sold a property within three years of purchase. I had clients that bought in 2018, 19, 20, 21. They sold in 2021. Might this affect them? Might, right? This also adds additional tax up to seven years. That's not on here. It's not 25%, but it's still a tax. If you ever had a client that has sold a property within seven years, might this affect them? So the goal that AB 1771 has is they believe that this would um, deter short-term investors to create more inventory, and then it would create additional tax revenue of a little over $4 billion. Um, up to you to decide on what side of this bill you may stand, and yet I highly recommend that you exercise your right to vote. Um, AB 2170, residential real property on foreclosure sales. So CAR is sponsoring this bill. This bill was introduced by California Assembly Member Tim Grayson. Um, should this pass, this is a little bit different. Now, let's say you have an institution like Fannie or Freddie that they have all these foreclosed homes. They have a couple options. They can put them regular on market and deal with um, regular consumers, residential purchasers, or they could sell to an institutional investor. Let's say like a Blackstone that wants to come in and buy a thousand properties in one go, go, right? What this bill would do, what would stop government sponsored entities or federal government institutions that have the opportunity, that have enough properties to do a bulk sale, it would stop these bulk sales to institutional investors. It would require them to put it on the market 
uh, and could consider and respond to offers from real homeowners at least for 30 days before opening it up to investors um, for bulk sale. Okay, so that's what AB 2170 is. The idea being, and CA are sponsoring this bill because they believe, hey, this will give more inventory for potential and real homeowners. That's what this bill is about. Um, uh, Constitutional Amendment number 14, the Housing Opportunities for Everyone or the HOPE Act. This is a new, this was introduced um, at the end of March. And basically what this would do is it would create an account that puts 5% of general funds tax revenue um, to be towards housing and homelessness, right? They're estimating that that would create about 10 billion in housing funding every single year that would go towards creating things like additional affordable housing units um, and helping house the homeless as well. So this is another, um, this is a constitutional amendment. This is a little bit different. Um, There are some more bills we'll revisit um, that we'll revisit, but we're not gonna dig too much into that today. Um, I'm also not gonna dig too much into these national updates. We've been talking about appreciation for a while. Um, I did do an update on this is the forbearance update as of April 15th. Um, you can download these slides after our call. They will be available to you um, with where our weekly market update normally is if you want to dig into this a little bit more. Um, but I just wanted to put it here for you. What I really want to spend some time on today, and thank you for, for bearing with this because I, I if there's questions, please put them in the chat. Um, but this idea that Gary said that inflation may be the sing- single biggest threat to democracy. I want to dig into this a little bit more. I want to talk about what is happening with inflation right now. Um, I want to talk about some of the causes of inflation. uh, And I want to give you a little bit more of an idea on how to look at the market and how to really understand um, how some of the things that happen in our economy impact real estate, right? So we look at some of the causes of inflation. Now, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is not the only cause of inflation. I'm going to say that right off the bat. However, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine does have an impact on our energy markets. They are an energy powerhouse. They are an oil powerhouse, right? So that does contribute to the market that we're in right now. What we know is that generally high inflation will always lead to higher interest rates. We're going to talk about that. Now, We also know that unemployment is about as good as it gets. It's at 3.6% nationally as of March 2022. However, we also have a lot of open jobs. So unemployment is very low, meaning that there are a lot of people that are getting an income, right? There's income that is coming in. The gross domestic product GDP annually is very high at 5.7% nationally. During COVID, this dipped to negative 31.2 was the single greatest dip that we have seen um, with the GDP ever, okay? And when that happened, the government took motions to stimulate the economy. They lowered interest rates, right? They um, did stimulus checks. They created all these different funds to help stimulate the economy so that purchasing still happens. Now let's talk about where inflation is right now. The consumer price index right now, right, is at five point uh, is at seven point zero four percent. The core CPI is at five point five. Now, we see inflation, and what happens? Consumers. It's not the companies that take this inflation; it's the consumer. We see the cost of gas go up. If you go to the store, I guarantee that as you're shopping for um, some of the things that you use in your daily life, right? Toothpaste, toilet paper, food, cost has gone up, right? Cost has gone up. You are experiencing this when you go to the market. You are experiencing this when you go to the store. Is this, this increase is being passed along to the consumer. But here's the thing, people are employed and we spend money like crazy not on the basis of economic cycle. So so let me talk to you about what that means. We see inflation go up. Did all of a sudden that stop people from spending? No, more people are buying cars, right? They've been stopped from doing this for two years that people have been in a pandemic and people are spending money on houses. People are spending money on cars. 
They spend money on the basis of their life cycles, not on the basis of what we see in the market. So what happens? The government says, wow, inflation is super high. We need to impact this, right? Or they say the GDP is super low. We need to impact this. What do we do? So when the GDP dropped to negative 31.2%, they lowered interest rates, right? They did all of these different things to stimulate the economy. Now the economy is stimulated and that inflation has gone up. So I'm gonna put this in perspective. What happens? The government says, wow, we need to drop this down. The federal government owns almost a third of the stock market. The bond market is about four times the size of the stock market. They own a lot of that too. When they experienced depression, so when the GDP was negative 31.2, they buy and they buoy it up, right? And this causes the market to go up. This stimulates the economy. And when we're experiencing high inflation, and so this can be tracked back to the 70s. This actually happened in the 70s as we entered in. If you look at um, where inflation was, and then I want you to look at where interest rates were, right, in 1970, 1971, 1972. It is a good look at this, at how this has happened in the past, right? When um, when the market is, is highly inflated, the government sells to drop it down and they start increasing the interest rates. Now, here's the thing. So they did this in the 70s. And what they found is they increased the interest rate to 5%, to 6%, and did it stop people from buying? So here's the thing. They will increase the interest rate until it changes consumer behavior. They will increase the interest rate until it changes consumer behavior, meaning they need this to go down. And so they will continue to increase. We are at about what I believe we're at about a five uh, and a quarter nationally right now on interest rates compared to where we were at the beginning of the year, compared to where we were a year ago. And it's going to continue to go up. The Federal Reserve was set, was set. So in February, we said they were set to raise rates about three times. Now we're looking at three to seven times over the course of 2022, because because of what's happening in the market, they will get more aggressive, right? They will get more aggressive. Now, here's the other thing. When we talk about this idea of a K-shaped recovery, right? What does that mean, right? This idea of of, um, of K-shaped recovery. This idea of K-shaped recovery is that those that own assets, those that already own houses, because of the market going up, they have gained more wealth, right? They have gained more wealth. They have more disposable income. They have more opportunity to cash out on the equity that they've gained. On the flip side of that, those that did not own assets, and are experiencing an increase in the cost of living. Gas, right? Things that you buy at the market, the things that you need to live, as that cost has gone up and yet income has not, right? It increases the gap. That's why we see some things that are a little bit different in some of the markets that we're used to right now. Uh, so I wanna put this in perspective for you guys because I think it's important to look at. Um, with that being said, the other thing that I wanna talk about this doesn't mean that there's not opportunity, right? This doesn't mean that there's not opportunity. What it means is we need to have a better idea of where the opportunity exists. So we also use the principles of economics to identify the market of the moment. There is a book, there's an author by the name of Harry Dent. Harry Dent was an economist that became a stock analyst. And what he surmised is that you can predict the economy by which demographic is the largest. So for those of you that have been around to remember the baby boomer era, right? If you look at the baby boomer era, what happened? All of a sudden there was way more babies. What happens when there's more babies? They need, in the time that there's all of a sudden all of these babies, they need diapers, right? And all of a sudden, then they get a little older. What do they need? They need things for school. And then what do they need? Because if that's the largest demographic that exists, it gives you an idea of where the spending is going to be. Now, the argument right now 
is that millennials are that cycle. Millennials is one of the largest demographics right now that is impacting the economy. The millennials are in purchasing power age for home ownership. I want to put that in perspective because we look at markets at the moment. And of course, we always want to look at our database, past client, agent to agent referrals, affidavit of death, divorces, absentee owners, all of the other areas that we also have opportunity. And yet, I want to put this idea of the millennials being one of the biggest groups with purchasing power right now into um, your mind, into how you look at your business um, and how we look at this for the shift. Because I share this on inflation as a, as a sort of introduction into some of what we're going to be teaching. A lot of what we're going to be talking about is the goal here is, is a couple of things. It's one, again, like I said, right? We want to get you into a very clear um, idea of how do I think about what is happening in the market and the economy right now so that I can be positioned as an expert of choice for my clients, but also how do I take advantage of some of what is happening in the market right now to better impact my business? And, and so this is why I want to share um, some of these things, right? This is why we share it. With that being said, so I'm going to, I'm going to switch my screen share really quick. We're going to go into another share. I'm going to draw something out with you that I think is going to be um, great for you to share with your clients. We're going to cancel it. We're going to say, got that. Um, give me a second. Oh, okay. Wait up. Ooh, I might not be able to draw it for you guys. Give me one. Open up a new folder and then um, get your drawing. I love the remarkable. Oh, I love it too. Here we go. There we go. Because I had it open, my friends. Who was that that just shared that? Was that you, Ebony? Thank you. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what I want to share with you guys is this is a, a um, good way to look at the market as a whole. So if we're talking to a client about investing in real estate, right? What happens is that a lot of our clients, they think that the market looks like this. This is what they think the market looks like. And what they think is that this is a good time to sell, but not to buy. And they think this is a good time to buy, but maybe not to sell, right? And they think that the market does this. It doesn't. This is not correct. This is not what happens with the market. And this is also this kind of idea that they have of what happens in real estate is the reason that people get nervous to buy when, in, when rates go up, when things like this happen. In reality, the market goes something like this. This is value, this is time. And it goes like that. Okay, so I want to put that in perspective for you, because I think sometimes when we're talking with our clients, um, we can explain a lot to them. It's a lot easier if you show them, right? Don't just tell them. I want you to show them because they think that this top is what is going on with the market. And that's not the case. What we know historically is that the market even when we experience major drops in the market, if you hold the asset long enough, it is a 4% on average appreciation year over year. If you look through the 70s, right, on what has happened in real estate, even though the market has gone down, right? So I want to put that in perspective with you because I, I think when we talk about inflation, we talk about everything that's going on, it is very easy to lose track of how do we explain this in a really simple way to our clients? Because here's the thing, logic makes you think, emotion makes you act. What I just shared on everything that we're talking about, that's logic. All of this is logic, is what is happening in the market. It's the, the data about what we see, but in reality, when we know the emotion is tied to being able to build wealth, to build a legacy for our family, 
right? We want to support that with evidence, but we also want to um, really simplify that for our clients. So I know that's a lot, a lot of information um, that I shared with you guys today on this. I do want to make a couple of, uh, I am in the wrong, what screen am I? I'm in the, all right. I'm hoping you guys can see where it says the future of floor time. One thumb up, my friends. Are we back on screen share? Nope. All right. So, okay, let's see. I see the chat box. All right, be beautiful. Yes, awesome. Okay, so a couple of things with that being said, I want to introduce a couple of programs that we are going to be running um, and then a couple of events that are coming up that are going to be important as well. So I know that was a lot of information and I hope that we got your brain kind of moving and thinking because what we are going to be doing a lot of is talking about this book here, Shift, right? Because here's the thing. This is a shifted market. It just doesn't look the way everybody expects it to. But that does not mean that the concepts that we train on are not just as important. Now, our goal is to gear you up to find the greatest amount of opportunity in the market. Not that we're just in right now, but I want you to think about where we're going. If all we did was prepare you for the market right now, you'd be out of business in a year, right? Our goal is to say, hey, this isn't about skating to where the puck is. It's about where the puck is going, right? That's a hockey metaphor. Um, and so that's really what we're going to be very focused on and teaching you some of these concepts. With that being said, it's also why we are introducing our future floor time program. We are starting that out this week. Um, I will be doing introductory classes on what the future floor time is once a month. Um, and we can introduce new groups into it on a monthly basis. The first starting group we have set right now, and then we will be introducing more. Um, with that being said, I've been talking about the future of floor time for the past month. Um, what this is, is a lead generation program. We know that in any sort of market that changes, we have to find more clients that are ready, willing, and able. We are using and, and marrying the power of lead generation with true data science. I know this sounds a little crazy, right? But with data science to test out a program that is meant to generate warm referral business meaning a true live handoff on the phone to a live client on the other side. Um, marrying data science, meaning there are certain activities that increase conversion, right? We'll be doing some masterminds on this. We'll be doing some classes, some best practices. Um, I do invite those that are interested to attend things like our best practice meeting. If you have interest in being part of this program, please come to the next introductory session on the calendar. Also. We're going to talk about unconscious bias in real estate. Next week on April 25th, we are going to be having a class at 9 a.m. with the phenomenal, phenomenal Julia Lachey Israel. She is the director of, of equity, inclusion, and diversity for our company. Uh, we are incredibly excited to be able to have her live with our region um, to teach unconscious bias. Unconscious bias in real estate. Trust me, we all have biases that exist in real estate. We have biases in our general life. It just is the way that it is. Um, what I love is that she shares some of these things that we need to become more conscious about in our real estate business and also how this contributes to increasing our business over time. We know that when I talk about this idea of millennials being one of the biggest groups that is coming into to homeownership, right right now that is aging into homeownership, they are also one of the most diverse groups that has ever existed in the United States. So is your business prepared to handle diversity at a large, uh, at, a, at a high scale? Is your marketing inclusive, right? Is the way that you speak to your clients inclusive? This is huge. And so there is an agent of distinction, unconscious bias in real estate is a prerequisite. The class that we're having on Monday on April 25th is free, right? It's 100% free to take the prerequisite if you decide you'd like to get the diversity certification. Also, our KWSL is six figure plus program. I've been hearing rave reviews and I know I just got a full overhaul update. Um, I, this has been going on on Thursdays. If you haven't attended yet, I know there's some really good sessions that are coming up that I'm sure you will all enjoy. Make sure you enroll for the next one. Uh, we have another using podcast for lead generation class coming up 
this coming month um, in about two weeks. So please, 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 if this is of interest to you, make sure you plan to attend that as well. So we will be digging into that a lot more. With that, I know that was a lot of information. We have our team meeting on the last week of the month. Um, and then I know some of you are going to be, at, which is next week. So next Tuesday, we have our team meeting at 3 p.m. Uh, and then I know many of you with Downey Association are going to be attending the bowling tournament with us on Thursday. We want to get as many people out there. So whether you're with the Downey Association or not, my friends, please come out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we'll have a big group in attendance to kind of have a good time and cheer each other on. With that, I hope you guys have a phenomenal phenomenal rest of your day. I will see you all soon. Bye everyone. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you, Monica. Absolutely.